So we're closing out the session. So this is going to be the most exciting session at 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. What else are you going to do, right? Um, I'm really thrilled to be in conversation with Jackie Jones. Jackie is a graduate of um, the EMBA program at Columbia, 2017. And uh, in our conversation, you'll learn a lot about her and her career and where she is today as a pivotal member of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in the gender equality sector, which has grown by leaps and bounds in a very unexpected period of time um, and very needed in the space um, of gender equality. So without much ado, Jackie, welcome. Thank you. And Hi, everybody. I'm excited to be here. I have to say, it looks a little bit different than yours all, doesn't it? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't live in New York City anymore. I live in Seattle, and I haven't been to the campus, and you guys really traded up big time. <laughs> it's beautiful. So we are both involved in the field of, of gender and of empowering women to um, lead in, in various sectors. And Jackie, can you talk a little bit about how you navigated a career in the social sector space? We both went to business school, you know, in the day when I graduated, certainly, and um, it wasn't really a career choice at that time. So we went through a few hoops before we landed. At least I did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I actually started my career in management consulting. I worked for Accenture, uh, which is a large global management consulting company, and I also, I didn't know, actually didn't even know you could be a management consultant when I graduated from undergrad. I did have a degree in business, but that wasn't kind of thrust in my face as, as a career option. Um, and so as I discovered that I really loved problem solving, found that as an industry that really appealed to me and the tools, toolkits and um, kind of problem solving frameworks, et cetera, were, were really interesting. And I didn't know you could get paid money to solve other people's problems. And so I, I navigated into that space and kind of climbed up through the ranks at Accenture. And something that Accenture does, still does, uh, that's really special is actually has a social sector yeah. uh, industry practice. It's called Accenture Development Partnerships, where people would sort of rotate in and out of traditional kind of corporate clients into development, international development sector clients. And I did learn about that on my first day. They talk about it in orientation. And I said, that sounds really interesting. I want to travel the world. I want to solve big problems. How do I do that? Um, and so I actually did three different tours of duty in that business unit. Uh, the first were, was working with the Water Research Institute in Sri Lanka, uh, where I went for six months and, and really did a project there and, and worked on sort of operating model design, organization design, et cetera. Um, and then I came back to the U.S. and sort of went back into the normal business and kind of kept climbing, et cetera. Um, and then I did my next tour of duty and I was in Ghana and I was working on a vaccine uh, immunization program, which was really looking at uh, caregivers and why caregivers bring their children to be vaccinated and how do you use actually just principles of marketing, quite frankly, um, to make that appealing and attractive to, to caregivers, mostly mothers, um, to bring their babies for free vaccines, uh, which is really critical. And something that was really special about that project, um, it, was, it was in partnership with the Coca-Cola company called Project Last Mile, which really took their marketing and supply chain know-how and tried to extract it um, and apply it into the immunization program of the country. And that was pretty powerful for me as an individual. Um, and then my last tour of duty, I, I went to Tanzania and lived and worked there and actually studied the management skills of maternity ward doctors uh, in uh, public health set settings, which was something I also knew nothing about. <laughs> it's a common theme um, I'm sure I'll talk about. Um, and I really, I really found that um, powerful that there were obviously needs um, in the business space that needed to be filled by people who had those skills. Um, and so I, I spent 10, year, 10 plus years at Accenture uh, before I left. I got a very unique opportunity to join the Gates Foundation. Um, but that part of my track at Accenture, very large place. I just saw yesterday they have 710,000 employees now. So wow. it's a big place, which means they do a little bit of everything um, and really gave me a foundation and a good starting point. What a great start. So we were both at um, UNGA this year, 
That's and the United Nations the United General Nations Assembly. <laughs> General Assembly. It's a week full of events and work around uh, various social issues. Um, and if we talk about gender equality, we learned there that the numbers have really gone haywire. Um, and then it's going to take us over 300 years to get to a gender equal world. And that before COVID, that number was about 150 years, which Davos had released you know, a few years ago. Um, and that's not the direction we want to go in. So I'd like to talk to you about why do you think we've slipped this far? I mean, obviously COVID had a huge impact, but what's going on in the world? Yeah, it has always been a difficult time uh, to be a woman. And in, if you're a woman of color or any other intersectional um, markers of identity, it's even more challenging. Um, you know, what do I think is happening? There are so many compounding barriers that impact humans, but impact women differently. And in the role that I'm in now, we really focus on the poorest women um, on the planet. And when you start with basic needs like health and infrastructure and home and food, um, you know, it's over and over again, women get less food on the table. You know, if the husband needs to eat for more of a laborious, physically laborious job, the woman eats less. Um, from a healthcare perspective, getting to the clinic is really challenging. You need to have some access to mobility. Um, and that's just the, the core basic sort of rung. And the barriers just compound on top of each other. So you don't have access to capital at all. You don't have a bank account. You're not allowed to have a phone or only one phone in the household. It's controlled by the man. Um, and so as you sort of think about ways to get to equality or equity, the barriers that are in front of women in particular are exceptionally challenging. And they are at every level. Um, we were talking about uh, before the session leadership. I mean, women who have very privileged backgrounds, access to great educations, excellent job opportunities and other stature, it's still really challenging to have an equal representation of women at a leadership table. And that's not just in the corporate sector, that's in the public but, sector, that's in um, health industries, that's in ministers of finance, where the decisions are really being made. And then what happens is those decisions get made by men and they're not necessarily representative of 50% of the population. And that's just this perpetual cycle we're in until we do something really pivotal to pull us out of that. I mean, just the, the statistics on scientific research that has been done on men's bodies for women's causes has been quite shocking. I don't know how many of you know, but seat belts were never tested on women. And so for the longest time, seat belts were actually unsafe for women until they were redesigned after doing an extensive test that showed that they really weren't built for women's bodies. So these are, you know, small facts that people don't even know about but have huge impact. Yeah, I mean, even just the COVID vaccine, right. we didn't get that tested in pregnant women right. for quite some time. And again, when you have a huge portion of the population in reproductive age in the middle of a pandemic, maybe we should be able to answer that question. And it was, it took quite a while before we were ready to say, yeah, we think this is safe for women who are pregnant and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, completely. So what could we do to speed it up? I mean, there are so many barriers. We've talked about some of them. You've participated in so many different sectors, and now obviously at the Gates Foundation there is a focus on a few specific ones. Tell us a little bit about those sectors and where you see the hope and the barriers being lifted. Yeah, I think ways we can speed it up. Um, one of the hardest things around gender equality, and you know this, Mona, is social norms. Mm -hmm. What is socially acceptable in the household, in the community, um, in the um, culture of, of a place where a woman's experiencing life. Um, and it takes a lot of courage to try to change those norms. I think we're seeing a live example with the women in Iran right now. Um, and it's terrifying. Um, and so undoing some of those social norms takes bringing cultural leaders, religious leaders, um, politicians, business leaders into the conversation on 
why it's okay when women are actors in their economy, why it's okay for women to um, have a role outside the home. Again, I focus on the really the most rural, poorest, challenging settings you could think of. Um, and I think those ten tenants are true actually for any context, um, for any, any type of individual. Um, what we do at the Gates Foundation, so we have a division that's called the Gender Equality Division, original, I know. Um, <laughs> we um, actually focus on in making philanthropic investments, grants, um, in those barriers I was talking about. So we do a lot of investment in um, healthcare for women, diagnostics, tools, places where, quite frankly, um, health companies don't see a ton of potential uh, ROI on investing in that population, but we do, and we have a unique role that we could play to, to make some of those investments that can help leapfrog and, and help women in very specific disease states that impact women, like cervical cancer, et cetera. Um, we also do a lot of grant making in the economic empowerment space. So I mentioned earlier, there's nothing more powerful than a woman having access to money. Mm -hmm. And that is true I feel that way now. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just, where's all the money? Well, it's amazing what you can do when you have money. Um, and, and so in that sense, how to educate women, financial literacy training, getting them access to bank accounts, digital bank accounts um, is, is very um, important and safer for women. Um, and then also teaching them what to do with that money um, and, and giving them skills so that they can earn money as micro-entrepreneurs, um, and start to, to build up ways to save. And we talk a lot about, you know, if you give a dollar to a woman versus give a dollar to a man, again, in these settings, it's going to go a lot further if you give it to the woman because she's going to invest it in the community, in her family, um, or give it to a, a friend, a, a, a peer friend, to help save or address a, an emergency issue. Um, and then probably one area that I want to make sure I mentioned that we make a lot of investments is in the policy and advocacy space. Um, this, is, this has been a new learning for me, again, coming from the private sector, corporate environment. I always knew there were government relations teams and a lot of attorneys who are making sure laws are, you know, creating an enabling environment for the company that I worked for or for my client to operate. Um, but there is a huge world of a lot of politically savvy individuals out there. Maybe I should go get a degree in political science next. I'm not sure. But that is such an important role. If we can't change systems from the law level in even in the United States um, and in, in the other countries we work in, it's a huge barrier. And crazy things happen. I learned literally this past week if you're a woman who earns money in Senegal and your husband is the sole earner and makes more, your money as the woman is taxed at a higher rate because it's considered a secondary income. That is crazy. <laughs> and it doesn't need to be that way. But some dudes got in a room probably and wrote some law and came up with a scheme. And that's, you know, another barrier that women have to face. Things like that. That's a, another space where we spend a bit of our time. Well, I mean, no surprise it happened in this country. My nope. work with the Equal Rights Amendment is uh, because women were never written into our Constitution and are still not in the U.S. Constitution. So next year will be 100 years that um, we've been fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment, and it has real impact. Um, we saw that with the Dobbs decision that just came about. Um, frankly, if we had had equal rights in the Constitution, that may not have happened. So it's, it really is worth... So giving us layers. some yeah. pause and thinking about these things. Um, but let's talk about money. I mean, we are in a business school, so let's talk <laughs> about money. Um, we all know the terrible statistics that less than 2% of all philanthropic funding goes to women and girls, despite all the work that Gates is doing and, and other organizations are doing. And less than 2% of, uh, oh, I think it's 4% of venture funding that goes yep. to female founders. So. Why do you think that is? I mean, we see this in our work every day, that women often find the solutions because they're dealing with a lot of the problems, and yet we're very loath to invest in them. I mean, why? I think a lot of it comes back to this concept of social right. norms and what, what people feel comfortable with. And, 
you know, you feel more comfortable giving money to someone who looks like you. That is just human nature and how biases work. And still to this day, a lot of the people giving money away are white dudes. No offense. Um, and, and that's real. And so until we have equal representation at the table and at the decision-making table and individuals who have are bringing their own money, and I think women are starting to make their own decisions in investing and their own decisions in their philanthropic giving at a faster rate than we've seen before, um, I think it's going to continue to be a challenge. What I think is crazy is when you look at the returns, the women-run companies are generating more returns for their shareholders. I, that just boggles my mind. And that's just that's not just for startups. When you also look at Fortune 500 CEOs, the female CEOs typically outperform their, their, their male peer, peers. And yes, it's very easy to critique those studies and there are a lot of variables, but you know, I think we didn't have any stats before, so some data is better than nothing. Um, I also think that I think women are, are getting a lot more confident, um, especially in the roles and the type of work they want to do, what decision-making tables they want to be at. And who they want to be around and the kind of maybe um, what used to be and I'm sure still exists in some industries or that old boys network is an interesting. So women are going and starting their own firms um, and they're getting capital in more creative ways through friends and family, through anonymous donors or anonymous givers. This is a space you know much better than I do. I think the savviness and sort of craftiness of how women are starting to navigate those spaces um, is, is smart, but it's still not the same as getting huge institutional investors at the same rate, and that's a problem for sure. Yeah, I think there's a credibility issue here, which um, is manufactured, quite frankly. And um, what I'd like to say is we need the male allyship to you know, stand up and say she is good enough or you know, better than good enough. Um, I read today that the first female hedge fund launched today with a billion dollars. I saw that. Which is awesome. So we need more of that. They can't, you know, they can't be a first, they can't be a second until they're the first, and they can't be a third and fourth and fifth until they're the first. But I think we need everybody in this room to support those first and make sure that they don't stop there. Um, let's talk a little bit about women's leadership, women's leadership in the business world. We are in a business school. Columbia produces incredible business people. And I think we've both seen that even in the business world and in the social impact world that we sit in now, um, decision-making by women is a little bit different. We saw it during COVID. Uh, we saw the collaborative you know, ness that came out of women sitting around a table and trying to figure out solutions. Um, do you see that at the Gates Foundation as well? How do you see that your investments in women pays, pays off? Yeah, so again, we are a grant maker. Um, maybe like a quick side note on philanthropic money and capital in general. Um, it, it, it is different. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of flexibility. Uh, you know, we don't have a lot of strings attached and the money is there. Uh, we have very generous living uh, founders with Bill and Melinda Gates who want to see their money spent in their lifetime and they want to see it spent on impact. Um, quantifiable, measurable impact. And, and so I've learned a lot about just philanthropic capital in general. Again, it wasn't a space I worked in clearly um, in my, my tenure before. Um, and there's different ways to give away philanthropic capital. Uh, there's very trust-based, you know, here's money, just give it to the organization. They know what, be what best to do with it. They know their space and, and their um, constituencies uh, best. And there's, you know, another spectrum, which is pretty controlled. And, you know, here's money to do this specific thing. And we want to see these specific outcomes and, and lots of things in between. I think in the women in le women's leadership space in particular, again, there's a very important um, triangle of things, I think, that happens when you think about trying to grow the pie of how many women leaders there are in, in important and critical decision-making roles. And for us, for, for development, to make more development um, progress in the world, we really believe 
the health, law, and economic sectors in particular are critical levers. Why? Because having more female judges is really important in how laws get set and how decisions get made in critical rulings in countries around the world. Um, from an economics perspective, having more female economists, um, not a guarantee uh, that all women in a leadership position are going to be kind of pro-women or quote unquote feminist in their decision-making rights, but your odds are a little higher that you're going to get someone who's thinking more feminist oriented if, if there's a woman with a seat at the table. And economists have so much power, right? They run, <laughs> they run the financial institutions that really make decisions that impact individuals' daily lives. And um, that's really critical. And then from a health perspective, having more chief uh, medical officers or uh, ministers of health uh, who are women um, again, just that representation of 50% of the population as disease states that impact women and often women and children because uh, women are often not only bearing the children but caring for the children um, is, can have uh, a lot of different out potential outcomes. And so we think of that triangle um, as individual empowerment. So you definitely need to make sure that women are feeling they have confidence and competence. Um, we also focus on organizational change. So it doesn't help to really empower a super strong woman, but then to like put her back in an organization that's just going to have organ rejection and, and sort of push her down at every turn. So how, we also make investments to work with organizations to really rethink their career ladders, um, policies that are prohibitive or, or cause limitations for people to progress in their career, et cetera. And then the third, this probably won't surprise, given what I mentioned earlier, is we look at policy, um, policy and laws um, from a perspective of, again, are there limitations for women having access to capital, starting businesses, owning land? You know, there's so many different variables and ways that women could play a leadership role. Um, going to school, what, what does that look like in those contexts and how important is that? Yeah, I've really come to appreciate how you can't really live in an equal life if you don't have the laws that protect you from doing that. Um, I'm in the middle of reading this really interesting book, which I'm going to recommend to you all. It's called The Donut, Donut Economics. I don't know if you've read it, but it's um, five women economists, including Esther Duflo, you know, who just won, uh, last year won the Nobel Prize in Economics. And it's a fascinating read of how the economy should not, no longer be defined by Keynes, may he rest in peace, <laughs> but, <laughs> but should really include the cost, the sort of the free labor of women in the workplace and what that does to economies. It's, it's really fascinating. I would recommend that you read it. Um, this has been a fascinating conversation. What would you say to this group of people that's going to go out into the world and lead businesses in the next few years and into the next century? Yeah, so uh, first, thanks for listening. Um, I hope you have questions. I think we're doing that next. Um, I would say something that I take a lot of pride in is really having a key North Star for myself and how I make decisions. Um, I wasn't looking for the role that I've stepped into now, and it was a really difficult decision to sort of leave something I was really comfortable with. But I just knew sort of in my core that I needed to, to, to branch out and try something new. Um, and then the second is always understand the flows of money. If you don't know where the money is being lost or gained, yeah. you don't know how the organization functions. And I see a lot of people who are really good at their job, but don't really understand their job in the context of the organization that they work in. And that's my main advice I give to anyone who asks me for career advice anytime. Do you know where the money is being lost and gained in any context? Absolutely. Should we open it up to a few questions? Oh, don't be shy. <laughs> it's like almost happy hour time. <laughs> this is not a shy group. Yeah. Here's one right here. Hi, thank you for being here. My name is Lauren Decker. I'm an alum. Um, I have a question about that 300 years for progress, which is pretty sobering to hear. Uh, I'm thinking about that perspective as a perspective of a mother of two children, two, two girls. Um, as I'm kind of coaching my daughter on my daughters on what their future looks like, 
um, how do you kind of think about how they can make impact for the greater world, but just how they can navigate their own life knowing this is part of what it means to be a woman in our country and our world? Do you want to go? I can take that, yeah. yeah. I think the next generation is very vocal about this. I have two daughters as well who just turned 21. Um, and you have to start treating them like adults to start with, right? So we just took our names off their bank accounts and said, okay, go for it. And um, I also think this generation is much more about equity than any generation I have ever seen before. Certainly not my parents' generation. I would say mixed in my generation, but definitely in the next generation. They look out for each other. Um, they worry about each other. And, um, and they demand more. We at Women Moving Millions, we host a summit every year. And this year's summit was about democracy, about you can't have democracy without gender equality. And we ended our session with three young high schoolers who were fighting for equal rights. Um, and they were called Generation Ratify. And I was, I was leading the panel with them. And, they, and I said, what advice would you give this group of funders that's sitting in this room that are probably older than your parents, what would you say to them? And it was very interesting because it was so unexpected. They said to me, they said, don't keep saying it's all up to you. Because everyone keeps telling us it's all up to the next generation. And we don't know what the hell we're doing. <laughs> all we know is that we're scared and we know we've inherited this place that is a disaster. You know, climate change is going to destroy everybody's life. There's going to be no earth left. There's going to be, you know, no opportunity for young women to thrive. So don't keep saying it's, you know, ours to fix. Um, so please make those connections. Mentor us. Tell us the hurdles that you've gone through. You know, tell us what you've dealt with so we don't have to make the same mistakes. And it's true. I mean, how often do we say, oh, you know, it's up to the next generation to find the solutions? It really isn't. It's, it's, uh, it's an intergenerational fight or an intergenerational um, experience that we really have to delve into. So, you know, certainly teach your daughters about what's going on, but let them have their eyes wide open, and um, hopefully they'll have their male friends stand up for them too. And they won't be the only ones at a table, which many of us were in our careers. Well, thank you very much, too, for just the work you do and the importance of, you know, traveling the world and, and meeting people where they are with all the different traumas. Um, my name is Kevin Foster. I'm the Corporate Engagement Coordinator at Exodus. We're a transitional community here in Harlem. So we have uh, many programs, probably 28, 29 programs, many of which are women programs, um, mental health, um, mm -hmm. homelessness, workforce development, um, we have uh, one of our, I had a woman walk up to me just the other day and say, you know, I, I'm interested in, you know, working with you guys to see if you can start a program for women who have been trafficked. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think that, you know, individuals, and we have wonderful women who work in our organization and work with these individuals who have experienced unsurmountable amounts of odds, um, addictions. I think that, you know, sometimes the environment in which they, they nobody wanted this, but I think that they are impacted, some are justice impacted, but they're also community impacted um, by the lack of opportunity and seeing, seeing avenues where they can have a more prosperous, they, they fall into some of the traps. So in, in your ventures all over the world and knowing that you've, you've you, when you're explaining some of the most extreme cases and they were in other countries, I'm like, well, I'm seeing them up, up a couple of blocks up the street. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is an element? Um, that you feel you always wanted to bring to your program or the programs that you were in that you were looking for that you felt was very important to to help on that journey back because there's a you know there there's a lot of ground ground to be gained and it it requires them to you know s stop moving in one direction and tar start taking small steps in another. Mm -hmm. And it's um, each, in each individual person having their own situation and circumstances, but the trauma being very real. Um, and what did you feel you, you looked for or did you like to bring to empowering them to start that pathway back to healing? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, and also for the work that you do. That sounds uh, really powerful and important. Um, two things come to mind. Uh, first, I think 
it's really important to include those women in the design of the experience or transformation or journey that you're you're wanting to set them on. Um, I I sit in a the funder's role. I couldn't be further removed um, from the day to day work, which is both a privilege and a luxury, but also quite frustrating sometimes because I'm not. I, I can't understand. I'm not in those communities, and I'm not from those communities. And so, having um, women in the community really co-create and design um, what those interventions are is critically important, both from a higher le- likelihood of of adoption and uptake. Also, they put their stamp on it, and there's a lot of pride um, in building something and and being a part of something, especially when you've been in a community and you're marginalized and you you don't get to play an active role in whatever um, uh, part of kind of society that your uh, part of the world world um, occupies. Um, and so that that leads me to having sort of skills around human-centered design. I know Columbia teaches um, some courses on that. Um, I, I did a, another tour of duty at Accenture in the human-centered design strategy space. And, you know, it was definitely on, very much on the corporate side, but those tenets of just really knowing how to ask questions, thinking about um, uh, journeys in the user experience kind of way, um, testing and iterating, like some of those core components I think are really valuable when thinking about you know, when you're, whether you're designing an app for a bank to designing a program that's going to um, build skill, w- workforce skills for someone, there's still some components to that that are similar that could be applied and I think could be really powerful. I think one thing to remember too is on the funding space, and I found it with communities of funders, um, is it always comes from a very personal space. And sometimes people look at funders as, you know, they're sort of up in that ivory tower. What do they know about stuff? And, um, and I think when you dig in, it always comes from a space that is meaningful. So for me, the most powerful tool, frankly, is storytelling and unlocking that story from both sides and trying to understand why, why does the funder care about this and, you know, what is it about the person that they're trying to help? What is it about their story that is important and resonates? And it creates a kind of connection which sort of dismisses all the hierarchy and the power structures of funders and grantees, because where is that? Um, and I think what Jackie talked about is understanding and helping the people who are in the center of it to gain some kind of you know, dignity and ownership, and not feel the shame that surrounds a lot of this, right? Because it's not their fault that they were trafficked, or, you know, or they were born into poverty or whatever. It was circumstantial. So to remove those barriers and sort of try and create a more even space where um, the value of human dignity can really be realized. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for being here to talk about the human leadership. And first of all, I'm, I'm a minority from Xinjiang, China. Many of you may heard about the from BBC News and NBC News talk about the human rights of Uyghurs in China. So that's my hometown. And also I have a startup start, uh, built last year. It's called Her Gallery, a virtual reality NFT arts platform. So me and my, our engineer to build up the, you know, uh, NFT arts um, platform. So each users can create their digital spaces in our platform. So we've been talking to the investment bank and also the investors. And each time the response is huge difference. Even we talk to the same product and same platform. So my question is, do you think there's a huge you know, the, 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 do you think the, the gender make huge differences when the woman to go to the fundraising in the market? So any suggestion for women to fundraising in the future? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, Jackie referenced it, that often um, 
most people want to fund who they see or somebody, somebody that looks like them. But I would suggest that you're lucky that you're here because, you know, Tamer does have a venture fund and um, they do coach students on how to start businesses and fundraise and grow them. So that is an opportunity that you can certainly take advantage of being at Columbia Business School. Um, on the gender piece, yeah, we know that women get less funding than, than men. Um, but we've got to be disruptive about that, right? We've got to disrupt the boys' club and, and say the ageless women's network is just as good or better or both. <laughs> so, um, funding is a big barrier, absolutely. So that's why it's important to unlock you know, all kinds of funding. You could do philanthropic funding. You can find some risk capital to take you over to the, uh, take you over the hump till you're ready to raise seed capital or venture funding. Um, but you're in a good place to get some of that information. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, Sarah Vakili, I'm in EMBA 23. And I feel we often have these conversations about women's equality in an echo chamber of just women who attend women's talks about women's equality. And I'm curious if you have any advice or thoughts on how to get more of our male colleagues into these conversations and participating and supporting and being there for us and not just letting it be a women's group initiative. Well, an un, probably uninvited comment is it should be part of the curriculum for many university learning environments, in my opinion. It's part of the workforce curriculum, mm -hmm. to be very frank. Now, I think that it's not um, non-negotiable, unconscious bias training, um, intersectionality understanding. I mean, I know... Obviously, I work at a pretty progressive place, but I have lots of friends at other giant Fortune 500 corporations, and they're going through those journeys. They may not like it, um, but that's part of the the time that we're in. You know, you have to kind of put it in the in your face. And so, I would see maybe there's a channel, a little advocacy channel there on. You know, what is Columbia doing in this topic? I'm sure this is not a very <laughs> welcomed comment, but I think it's important. The systems change and, and those where those decisions are made is really powerful. Um, and I, I could see there being uh, some opening. And maybe it's already happening, so I shouldn't make that assumption. Um, but that, that immediately comes to mind. You know, getting the, forcing the conversation in a class, um, having professors who are talking about this, um, when you're working in group dynamics, you know, calling out the slights or um, the the potential feelings of um, discrimination or um, you know judgment or whatever it might be, and that's not just not just happening to women. That's happening to all types of um, people with different identities, and I think the. Being um, comfortable uh, raising that is takes practice, and I think a learning environment is such a great place to practice. So that would be my push. I'd say it begins at home. You know, it begins with conversations around the dinner table. Um, it begins with having uh, men do more caregiving of babies and and uh, raising families. Um, and that's a cultural shift. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But I think we're seeing more of it. Corporate America can certainly help. You're seeing now much more sort of paternal leave and maternal leave. You know, like there, there are things happening that I could have never imagined in, in the time when I set upon my career. Um, and having those conversations, you know, how many Thanksgiving tables have we been around where someone has said something so incredibly misogynistic and we just kind of have to swallow it and listen to it. But you don't have to do that anymore. Um, so I think it's time to have those difficult conversations and, and really, you know, outline that it's not that difficult, quite frankly. And there's great joy in partnership in, uh, in, a, in a relationship if it happens to be male and female, right? Um, where both take equal responsibility for the family so that both can take equal responsibility for being out in the workforce and, uh, and building their lives and careers together. I will say there's a lot of men here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not that I would expect people to leave just, I mean, this is a pretty broad topic, but, you know, I think it's good. It's a good start. <laughs>
And you need everybody around the table. Look, it, it can't, you know, the world can't be run just by men, even if they may think so. So... <laughs> Hello, I am Gitika from SIPA and thank you for taking out the time and sharing your insights. Uh, I had a question with regard to your ex uh, investing experience. And one thing, like you very rightly mentioned that financing is a big challenge, right? So for those who want to do it, what are some of the measures that you might recommend for someone to be able to integrate an active uh, gender lens in their investment decision making? And especially with regards to blended finance, if you think there's scope and what else can be done? Thank you. For personal investing or? Uh, both. Both, oh, institutional yeah. as well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So we actually have a practice for any grant that we make, we have a set of questions that we ask to see how gender um, intentional is it kind of on a spectrum. And not every grant will be. Um, but there are, there are opportunities in, uns in surprising places. Um, and really, the first question is, are you collecting sex disaggregated data? Mm -hmm. We know so little about women because we collect data only on men or just on the human population in general with no gender breakdown. And I think that that's true, um, obviously, in, in the development sector, which is a bit unique. But I think from a more traditional investing perspective, you want to know... What's your customer breakdown? And you want to have that demographic information. I think that's you know a little more common from a um, market segmentation perspective. But it's shocking sometimes how little information there is. So if you were going to invest in a you know biotech startup or something like that, um, are they developing any drugs that include women in clinical trials? Mm -hmm. I mean, you would be shocked how few women are represented in clinical trials. And wow, isn't that just limiting? 50% of your, not only potential revenue, but just understanding of, of the science and the technology and the innovation, and all of those kinds of things. So that's one pretty tangible example. Um, and then we also ask questions around um, unintentional harm. And will this, inner, this grant, this intervention, this product, this service, um, maybe create a space that it, um, has undue harm? And again, in the development space, it's a little bit more likely to happen where, you know, if you introduce a new product in the home, let's say it's a new smartphone, there is a high likelihood that that phone can be a cause for violence, um, that it could be cause for, um, uh, like, thievery, like, lots of different challenges can um, happen and, and uncover when you introduce something new into, a, into an environment and an ecosystem. Again, in a more traditional investing sense, I think um, kind of really understanding the value chain um, of the product or service or, or tool, um, do you really understand where the, um, who's making those products, um, who's being paid to make those products, are they getting paid a fair wage? You know, there's ways in which we really exacerbate and exploit a lot of different types of people, but women in particular who are often in those laboring positions um, and, and roles, where you can ask some smart questions in that space. Um, I'll stop there. I'm sure Mona has some I think in the investment space, this is actually a great opportunity. Um, and it behooves you as an investor who's going to invest your own capital to ask those questions before you hand that money over to someone who's going to do it for you. Right, so um, we found in sort of the wealth management, investment management portfolio, there's still a lot of question about what is a gender lens. You know, some portfolio managers will come back and say, well, they have two women on their board. Well, that's not enough of a gender lens for me. So I think you have to start with listing out, as Jackie said, what are your own values? What are your own priorities? And then, you know, 
kind of ranking them in a way to say what's more important and what's less important. And then when you are having that conversation with whoever is investing your money or looking at places where you want to do it yourself, kind of running through that checklist and saying, okay, where do they stand on this? And, and being pretty firm about saying, well, you don't meet five out of 10 criteria, so you're out. And that creates change because people start realizing that customers are not getting what they want, and then that's going to change the industry a little bit because there's a lot of pink washing and green washing and you know all of that stuff. And as investors, you have the power because it's your money. And so at the end of the day, you have to hold people accountable who are investing it for you. Do we have time for one more or are we done? So maybe the last question, do we have one more? Hi, my name is Ariel. I'm a CBS alum. And my question is around mentorship. Uh, it seems like a lot of women who are in senior leadership positions are kind of acknowledging the fact that maybe there's a certain number of seats at the table. And so they'll mentor women, but they might feel this tension that they might be outed by this younger up-and-comer. And so mentorship is a bit difficult these days, especially when also around the Me Too movement, men are a little bit reticent about mentoring younger women. I wonder what your experiences with this or observations are around these issues that might be coming up for a number of us. I mean, I know they're real, but that needs to be called out because that is such a fallacy. Um, people need to come from a place of abundance, right? I mean, it's not a scarcity factor here. If you want to grow your economy or you want to grow the GDP of a country, you can't do it by limiting. You really have to expand. And you have to realize that diversity, inclusion, all the things that you hear about, the buzzwords, um, will remain buzzwords until you actually have an expansive view of what needs to be done. You know, we know the statistics around diversity. We know better decisions are made when there are more women at the table. We know women CEOs do better. We know women entrepreneurs outperform the market. So it's, it's time that people sort of stop with this negative narrative of, you know, I can't be a mentor because, I mean, I'm sorry, that's bullshit, right? So you just have to call it out and say, you don't lose anything by mentoring people. You're actually passing your own knowledge and your skills on so that somebody else is not going to fall into the same rabbit holes that, you know, you may have, have done. So I just think... Um, that's just a sore excuse, and you have to say, sorry, I'm not listening to that. You know, if a, if a male boss is not going to invite you out to do something where, you know, you need help or you're asking for something, you take that step, right? There's nothing that prevents you from saying, look, I need a little advice on this. Can I come to you and talk to you about it? You know, sure. Maybe I'll just add one, one final thought on that. I have a, a pretty... Um, a personal practice that I do, which may or may not help you, but I'll share it anyway. Um, I have a personal board of directors. So I'm sh maybe you would talk about this in yeah. school um, at, at CBS, but for me, that personal board of directors operates just like any other board for like, I don't know, Jackie Enterprise, I guess. <laughs> um, and I've got different skill sets and different um, profiles of individuals that I turn to at different times when I'm making career decisions or running into challenges like you're identifying. Um, and I'm pretty upfront about it. And I, I just say, hey, uh, I have this board of directors. Are you willing to be on it? Uh, I might call you once a quarter. I might call you once every three years. But I just want you to know that you are a person that I value your input. You know a bit about me or a lot about me. You know how I make decisions. You know what's important to me. Are you willing to kind of ride along on this journey as I make crazy decisions and, and things like that? And it's proved to be pretty successful for me so far. Um, I've got a, a good crew. It's men and women. Mm -hmm. um, people I've gathered along the way. Some people I've worked with. Some people I've never worked with. Um, some people I've just clicked with um, and been like, hmm, I think there's something here. And uh, interestingly, I get often asked to return the favor um, uh, when some of those individuals are, are at the points of making decisions. Some are personal friends. Um, you know, I, I don't really include family. They get a, <laughs> they get enough. They get a pass. They get enough. <laughs> 
Um, and so I, I just share that as a practice. Um, you know, I, I like, I'm very tangible and pragmatic. And for me, I can kind of dust that off when I'm feeling like frustrated or someone's being an ass. And I'm like, Ugh. you know, and you're just like, how am I going to talk through this? Or like, someone's going to tell me, you should leave that place. That's not worth it. Your time and talent is not worth it for, for that environment, et cetera. And so maybe Mona will be in my board of directors. <laughs> I'd be happy to. I think that's really important. And, you know, every one of us has experiences that other people can learn from, right? So be generous with your own time as well. I think it's unfair to ask of people to mentor you if you're not willing to give it back to someone else. So pay it forward because that's worth it. But that's a great idea. And we all have it in some sort of informal way, right? I mean, even this decision for me to step back into a leadership role was uh, made after much consulting with a lot of people. So use, use your networks wisely. Thank you much for being here. I think... Um, <laughs> this is great.